Awesome. So if you would open with me uh, to Luke, the Gospel of Luke, found in your New Testament, chapter 9. We're going to be looking at verses 18 through 27. If you don't have a Bible, you can follow along on the screen here. But what I'd really encourage you to do is we have uh, Bibles in the back. So I'd encourage you to go grab one so that you can have uh, a Bible for yourself. That's yours to keep our gift to you. So let's look at it. Luke 9, starting in verses 18. It says, Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, Who do the crowds say I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And still others, that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. But what about you, he said. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. And he said, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law. And he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the Father and of the holy angels. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. This is God's word. Let us pray. Lord, we lift up this time to you. That as we've opened your word, we ask that it is already going out into our hearts that have been prepared and tilled and, and are made ready through the praises that we've just sung. Maybe it's through the trials that we've been going through this week or, or the things that have been impressed or, or uh, already on our hearts that you've already been doing in our lives this last week. I just ask that today would be a confirmation or a challenge to those things. Lord, I ask you to be with us, Lord God, that we, we don't want to be in, a, in an empty building without your presence. And so we ask that and, and believe that as we open your word, that you will speak, that we will hear your words. Lord God, so I just ask that we are ready to receive from you. It would be having our hearts ready to hear your words, put them into practice, and have our lives changed, Lord God. So we love you. We thank you. We, we submit this time to you, to your glory. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen. <clears throat> All right. Today, very interesting passage. We're going to be looking at one of the most difficult places in the Scripture. I really, really wrestled over this text this last week. And it's not because of its lack of clarity, but because of the astonishing claims and clarity that Jesus has in these passages. And the reason I say difficult is because what Jesus has to say about himself and about those who follow him may seem extreme. They may seem too black and white. And that's because they are. They are black and white. They are extreme. But it's not really because Jesus is extreme or too black and white, but because we aren't enough. And today, I believe we're going to see three big things. We're going to see that Jesus is the Messiah. We're going to see what is going to happen and did happen to Jesus, the Messiah, and what it takes to follow Jesus, the Messiah. So, if this is your first time with us, we have been going through a series called Luke, the Orderly Account of Truth. And in this series, we've been going verse by verse through the, Luke, or for, through the Gospel of Luke, which is a closely documented and investigated account of Jesus' life and ministry as put forth by Luke, the doctor. The hope of this series is that as we continue to look at these things that Jesus taught, that Jesus did, that we will be encouraged and strengthened in our belief and certainty in the person and work of Jesus Christ our Lord. And last week specifically, we saw Luke. He shared the incredible and amazing miraculous event of Jesus feeding over 5,000 people with just five loaves of bread and two small fish. 
Once again, this is Jesus showing himself to be the long-awaited prophet that the people had been waiting for. But it wasn't only that. It was, it was him, him showing himself to be God in the flesh. We saw him perform this amazing miracle of creation and provision. And now this week, Luke is going to shift scenes in the gospel to another event where Jesus is going to ask his disciples one of the most important questions in this life. And after that, he's going to share with them a little bit more about what that means and what that means for them. Today, honestly, kind of feels like a Christianity, like 101, um, which is kind of cool. Um, it was a consideration for a message title. But if you are taking notes today, today's message is titled this. The Costly Confession. The Costly Confession. So Luke has moved us to the scene where Jesus is praying with his disciples and then turns to a very, it ends up becoming this very important conversations that he, conversation that he has with them. Like I said, he's going to ask them one of the most important questions not only they, but every single one of us needs to answer in this life. Let's look at it. We're going to start in verses 18 and 19. Once when Jesus was praying in private and his disciples were with him, he asked them, who do the crowd say I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others that one of the prophets of long ago has come back to life. So Jesus is asking his followers, what are you guys hearing about who I am? Who are people starting to, what, what are the rumors going around? Who, who do people say that I am? And now his disciples start to lift off, list off a bunch of big name celebrities from the recent and distant past. We have John the Baptist, who was dead. Elijah, who technically never died. He just went up in a chariot of fire. So I don't know what we classify that as. Or maybe Jesus was some other prophet who had died from long ago. The big idea here is that the people believed that Jesus was some kind of prophet. And now today, if you were to go around and ask, who do you think Jesus is? What kind of answers would you get? In today's day and age, if you were to go around and say, who do you say Jesus is? If, if Jesus were to ask you, who do people say that I am? What, what would the answers be? Think about that. If you were to ask your coworkers or your family who does not believe, what are the answers that you would get? I think some of the ones that we may get are, he was a myth. He never existed. Maybe he was a good teacher, and they threw him up there with all those other B-list teachers, Buddha, and, and all them. Or maybe like the crowds in, in Jesus' day, a great prophet. He was, he was a, a great prophet. He spoke for God. But Jesus has a more pressing question. And it's much more important than just, who do others say that I am? But who do you say he is? Who do you say he is? And we're going to look at that in our next verse. Verse 20. But what about you, he asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, God's Messiah. Jesus asked the most important question, who do you say I am? Now it needs to be understand, uh, understood that what Jesus isn't saying, he's not saying that who he is is defined by what others think about him. So if, if he's your God, he's your God. If he's a good teacher, he's your good teacher. If he's some guy, he's some guy. That's not why Jesus is asking. It's not why he's asking his disciples. But he's asking his disciples because he wants to know if they recognize who he truly is. And Peter, good old Peter, he gets the right answer. He says, God's Messiah, or your translation may say, the Christ of God. And the title of Christ is the Greek word for Messiah, both meaning the anointed one. And that is the anointed one that God had promised to send to save his people. And now Peter is, is having this conversation with Jesus and, is, and tells Jesus that he believes that Jesus was the one who was going to come and has come. That's amazing. Heck yeah. And this is an amazing profession. 
This is an amazing confession of faith that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is God's chosen one. This is a really, really big deal. This is a, 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 the most important confession that anyone could ever make. And that's why I think it's amazing that in, in Matthew's gospel, when he records this event, we get to see Jesus' response to this. And we're going to look at it in Matthew 16, verses 16 through 17. So Jesus had just asked him, well, who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, and it's actually kind of a fuller answer. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. He could have answered that more perfectly if he tried. And Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. This is really interesting. Look at this. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my father, in heaven. That is, that it's not that Peter was smarter than the crowds or knew his Bible better than other people, but that God the Father had revealed this truth to Peter. And this is ultimately our prayer for anyone who has yet to profess Jesus as the Christ, that God the Father would reveal the truth of who Jesus is to them. And this question of who Jesus is, like I keep saying, is the most important question that we will ever face. Because once faced with this truth of who Jesus is, we only have two choices. We only have two choices. That is, believe in him or reject him. There are still some who know that Jesus is the Messiah. And in their sin and rebellion, reject him. If you want a, qu a couple quick examples, Satan and his demons, they know exactly who God is. And they don't want anything to do with him. They don't want to submit. They will submit one day. They will yield. But they don't want to. They know exactly who God is. So our hope and our prayer is that for everyone who does recognize that Jesus is the Messiah, that it would be the type of revelation that comes from God the Father that leads them to following Jesus. Which in a minute Jesus is going to define and tell us what that looks like. But as we see in our next portion of the text, Jesus is going to tell his disciples what is going to happen to him as the Messiah. But first he says something very interesting. Let's look at it in verse 21. Jesus strictly warned them not to tell this to anyone. That's weird, right? After Peter makes a confession of who he is, most important question, Jesus tells them not to tell anyone who he is. And this might not make sense to them or to us. But if it doesn't make sense, it's only because just like them, they did not yet realize the bigger plan that God had in store. There was a bigger plan. There was something bigger going on there. The disciples and people of Israel were waiting for the Messiah to come and do what? Save God's people. That's what they were waiting for. But they misunderstood how the Messiah was going to save them. They thought the Messiah would come as a king who would come and fight off those pesky Romans who keep occupying and taking their land. That maybe he would come and save Israel from their enemies. And in John's gospel, right after Jesus feeds the 5,000, the story we looked at last week, after Jesus does that, Jesus, <laughs> he perceives that doing such an amazing miracle, all the, all the people are starting to go like, should we make this guy king? Should we go get this guy and make him king? I mean, he just fed us with bread and fish. And I only saw the boy with the fish and the bread. And there wasn't a lot of it. But we all ate and we're completely satisfied. Jesus perceives that after this amazing miracle, the people are going to take him and try and make him king by force. So what he does is he pieces out. He's like, all right, I'm getting out of here. So he gets out of there before they could do that. And why? Because that is not why he was sent in the first place. Yes, he was sent to save his people. But it wasn't from the Romans who occupied their land, but from the sin that occupied their hearts. 
So this would make sense why he didn't want them sharing who he was. Because once again, the people misunderstanding the purpose of his arrival tried to make him do something he hadn't been sent to do. Does that make sense? I think it's helpful for us to kind of work through some of these texts because we, we see texts like this and we're like, Jesus, this seems like the opposite of what we're supposed to do. So what, what's going on here? But that's what context is very, very important. But instead, Jesus now tells him the purpose of his coming. That is to suffer, be rejected, killed, and raised on the third day. Let's look at it in verse 22. And he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Jesus says the Son of Man must suffer. And the Son of Man was just another title for the Messiah, which is kind of funny. Jesus is like, all right, we're, just, we're going to use the same term. We're going to use a little, little bit different terms. But he's affirming after they answer correctly who he is. He's like, yep, and don't tell anyone about it. By the way, this is what's going to happen to the Messiah, me. He tells his disciples the shocking truth. This is shocking news. That he, the Messiah, must suffer, be rejected by the leaders of Israel, and ultimately be killed. Jesus does say that he'll be raised to life at the third day. But you can imagine this news coming as shock to the disciples. I think if we were to try and put ourselves in the, their situation, because for us on this side of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, we're like, don't worry, guys. It's going to be okay. It's all going to work out. It's really awesome. This is for your good. But if, you, if, you were, if we were to put ourselves in their shoes, we have to understand that they were the first to really hear this news. They're following this person that they believe is the Messiah, is the chosen one. He's the one who's come to, to free them and save them. The rabbi, their teacher. And now he's telling them, I'm going to suffer. I'm going to be rejected. I'm going to be killed. And I will be raised to life on the third day. And if I was in their shoes, I'm sure I would have a hands, my hands full getting my head wrapped around the first three things he just said. That personally, it might be easy for me to forget about the last thing he said. I'm like, hold up, what did you just say? What were those first three again? You're going to do, what's going to happen to you? And we get this idea of shock from the disciples because we see the response to this news from Peter. Once again, good on you, Peter, right? Peter's like 1-0 right now, right? That scoreboard's about to change. Let's look at Peter's response, also found in Matthew's gospel account of this same event. Uh-oh, Peter. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said. This shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but he, uh, merely human concerns. He's now one in one. He had the right confession. He didn't quite understand exactly what was going on yet. So he's right in the person. He just didn't know what the plan was. He didn't know what it was fully. Jesus says that the Son of Man must suffer, be rejected, killed, and raised. And here he tells Peter, who says, don't do that. He says, you're not even considering what God's plan is in this situation. You're just thinking about yourself. You're just thinking about your concerns. You're thinking about merely human concerns, which makes sense. I mean, there's one sense which we like, can kind of empathize with him. He said, I'm going to die and He's like, oh, people are going to come after you. I'll be right there with you, and I'll stop them. You know, and Jesus is like, you don't understand what's going on here. But God has a bigger plan at work. And what's amazing is this wasn't a new plan. Jesus wasn't introducing a new plan. 
actually, if Peter had known his Bible better, he might have caught on that this was the plan. Is Jesus was the lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world as to ransom and save people from every tribe, tongue, and nation for all who would believe in him. And, and, and to say that he was the lamb slain before the foundation of the world meant it was always the plan. It, was, it wasn't a new thing. But Jesus was going to be the suffering servant of Isaiah 53. If you haven't read that chapter, go read it. it talks about that the Messiah, the one to come, would be the one who would bear the guilt and sin of his people and satisfy the wrath due their sin. Jesus is the Messiah who is here to put death to death in his death on the cross. That Jesus would bear the punishment of the sin for all who would believe in him. And this is, is such great news. This is actually really, really good news. And so much bigger news and better news than Jesus just being sent to deliver him from other nations, other the Romans or, or other enemies. That Jesus was the Messiah who was sent to live and die in our place. And Jesus has just told the disciples the necessary components, the necessary parts of that plan. It doesn't necessarily tell us here that he's like, and that's why we'll all be okay. He just says, this is what's going to happen. But now Jesus is going to shift focus and he's going to move from who he is and what he is going to do. The Jesus who would who'd soon suffer and be rejected and killed looks to those following him and tells them what they must do to follow him. We see this in our next verse, verse 23. Then he said to them all, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. Jesus says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, must take up their cross daily and follow him. This is actually very interesting. Jesus has yet to go to the cross. At this point, Jesus hasn't even gone to the cross. And he's looking to his disciples after telling them what's going to happen to him. He didn't necessarily tell them how it was going to happen. He says, I'm going to die. I'm going to come back to life. And he looks to his followers and tells them that you must deny yourselves and take up your cross and follow me. And being that they were people who were living under Roman rule, being that the crucifixion, which is dying the death on a cross, which is a crime for a, a criminal or a punishment for a criminal, they either would have been well acquainted or at least heard of the horrors of the death penalty by the cross. They're being told that if they want to follow him, they need to deny themselves and crucify themselves daily. Plainly put, Jesus is saying, you need to die to yourself and follow me. If you want to be my disciples, you need to die to yourself and follow me. If you want to follow Christ, you must die to yourself. You must deny yourself. You must be willing to suffer. Daily putting yourself and your own desires to death. Jesus says, you must. Now Jesus does not say that in order to save yourselves, you must do these things to be saved. That's not what he says. No, but that those who truly follow him, if you want to be my disciple, if you want to learn from me, if you want to follow after me, this is the mark. This is what it looks like. This is what you have to do. This is the mark of a true follower. Jesus' true followers are the ones who do deny themselves, die to their own passions and desires for the sake of following and obeying Christ. We see this in Galatians. We see this all over Scripture, but I, I pulled this verse. I feel like it was very clear. Galatians 5, 24. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Now, 
And Jesus is honestly, at this point, he's just going to continue to drive deeper and deeper this point that he is making. We can look at it in verse 24. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Jesus says that those who try to save their life, those who try to hold on to and cling to their old self, their old ways, they will be lost. But if you abandon your ways, abandon yourself for Christ, you will save your life. That is, you must stop trusting in yourself in your own ways and start trusting in Jesus Christ and his ways and actually following after them, which I, I don't know if it's good news or bad news to some of you, but most of the time our ways and Jesus' ways are not the same things. They're very different. And most of the time they're at odds with each other. So if you're taking notes, you can write this down for today's main point. To live for Jesus, you must die to yourself. To live for Jesus, you must die to yourself. And if you, maybe make it more personal. Don't write it down like that because you're just going to be like, yeah, they do. You do. Make it more personal. If I'm going to live for Jesus, I have to die to myself. Jesus says that if you're going to follow him, you must stop following yourself. You must stop following the ways of this world. If you follow yourself, if you follow this world, then you can't follow Jesus. Jesus' ways are not the ways of this world or the ways of our own wicked heart. So we cannot follow both. You cannot follow both. Jesus asks then, or then asks a rhetorical question in verse 25. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world and yet lose or forfeit their very self? Anyone? It's not good, right? It's not good to gain the world but lose your soul. But do you know what's really, really unfortunate? In so many instances, we aren't even offered the entire world. And yet, we're tempted to trade our soul for so much less. We don't even get offered the world. And we're like, I might consider it. <laughs> to gain a little comfort, happiness, relaxation, peace, we'll sell our soul. To get ours before we lose it all. To live our life and enjoy it before it's gone. But that's not living like a Christian with hope in Christ. That's living like a pagan or an atheist who believes that this life is all we have. If that's what we believe, well, then we should satisfy ourselves first and foremost. But that is living for ourselves. And Jesus says, such a person cannot be my disciple. Any person who is going to follow me must live for me. Not themselves. And why is this so important? There's a reason for this. This doesn't just feel like, I mean, it is a Jesus party. It's all about Jesus, okay? So we need, we'll need to get over that for sure. We definitely are going to need to get over that. But why is this so important that we are not living for ourselves, that we do not live for ourselves? Because if we ultimately live for ourselves, then even if we claim Christ as Lord, it's only a matter of time before we desert him or deny him because it will most suit us in this life. I'm going to say that again. If we ultimately live for ourselves, then even if we claim Christ as Lord, it's only a matter of time before we desert him and deny him because it will most suit us in this life. In this life, in this world, if we want to fit in and be a part of what's going on, it will most suit us to deny, reject Christ. I think that's why Jesus says what he says next. It's very important. 
Verse 26. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words. Jesus says, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the son of man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and in the glory of the father and of the holy angels. Jesus just told his disciples what was going to happen to him. Jesus was going to suffer, be rejected, and killed. That was the bad, that was the bad news. That's who they were following. That's what was going to happen to their leader. And that means if you're going to follow him, if you're going to follow Jesus, you could. You can and you should expect the same. If that's how the world treated Jesus, how much more those who follow him? This means you, you will suffer because of him. That you will be rejected because of him. That you may even be killed because of him. And if there's any part of you that does live for yourself... Let this be a sobering moment. To follow Jesus will be uncomfortable. You will face suffering. You will face rejection. And you may even face death on account of his name. But if you live for yourself, you will do whatever you can to preserve yourself. Even if it means denying Jesus by being ashamed of Jesus and his words. Here's the deal. The world's kind of interesting. They don't mind Jesus until he opens his mouth. You know what I mean? Everyone really likes the idea of Jesus. Seems like a good guy, a good idea. And you're like, have you heard what he said? And if they don't like him, they most likely have. And it's only a matter of time when you start telling them what Jesus teaches. And it's not because what he says is wrong or bad or evil but because the people are. And here's the deal. Not just them. We were all sinners in rebellion against God at one point. Christ loved us. That's the greatest news. He laid down his life for us, even while we were still his enemies. But what's amazing is people really don't have a problem with Jesus until he starts to talk. Why this is important is because as followers of Jesus, to have our minds renewed by his word, to have our lives conformed by his word, what's going to start to come out of us? Jesus' words, the things that he spoke, the things that he preached, the things that he taught, they were all true things. But if we're ashamed of those words, if we're ashamed of him, Jesus says when he returns, he will be ashamed of you. Now, I told you this is a difficult text because Jesus does not pull punches. I couldn't soften this if I tried. You know what I mean? Even if I tried to get rid of this, don't believe me. Believe what he said. He's telling you the truth. It is sobering. One of the commentaries I read this week put it like this. You can either deny Christ and follow yourself, or you deny yourself and follow Christ. And I need the band to come up, please. You can either deny Christ and follow yourself, or deny yourself and follow Christ. And to finish up our text for today, let's look at our last verse, verse 27. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the kingdom of God. It's kind of a cool text. Jesus tells his disciples that there, were, that there were some there, some standing there hearing his words that would not die before they see the kingdom of God. Now, here's the deal. This is where things get a little interesting. It's debated about exactly when Jesus meant by this. There's lots of different ideas. This could have been the transfiguration. This could have been at the resurrection. This could have been at Pentecost. 
Uh, this could have even been at the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. There's all kinds of ideas. Personally, I would lean towards one of the, the, the latter two. When exactly it would happen, I don't think is the important part. I don't believe that that is the important part of when it would happen. The important part is that Jesus, who speaks only the truth, says that some standing there would see it come. This also implies that some standing there would die before that time came. He's promising, hey, some of you here, you'll see it. And it wouldn't really make sense if this was like next week, right? That'd be kind of a weird thing to say. He says, some standing here will see it. Also, like I said, it could be implied that that means that some standing there would not see that day. I think this is important because it goes back to what Jesus was just speaking to. Of the denial of self, of following him, of not being ashamed of him. Because there were those who were going to and did suffer for Jesus on account of him. There were some who would be rejected on account of him. And there were some who would be killed on account of him. Now by God's grace and his mercy in Christ Jesus, one day we believe that we will be raised on account of him. And that is good news. Jesus is saying, if you try to cling on to this life with the, with the preservation of self at the forefront of your purpose, you will ultimately lose your life. But if you lose your life, if you crucify your self-preserving, selfish ways on account of following Jesus and his way, you will, re- you will reap eternal life. And the cost of following Jesus as the Messiah not only takes a toll on our life as it regards persecution from others. And we live in a day and age where we can kind of understand that. We can see some areas where like, if I was more outspoken about what I believe, it would not, it would not go well. Probably not being killed. Definitely being rejected. I'd suffer maybe in some ways. But it's also the cost of putting to death our self-preserving, self-seeking, selfish ways that want to lead us away from Christ. I'd say that's probably one of the hardest places to put to death. That's one of the, the most difficult things to put to death. Because it's, to start with, it's who we used to identify with. It was the things we used to do. It's the person we used to be. It's, we're, we're calling those things to be put to death. Because we need to not be deceived. So don't be deceived. The cares of this world, the worries of this life, want to pull you away from the one thing that can actually save your life and actually save your soul. And here's the deal. Satan is a liar and a deceiver. And he will offer you the world to try and make sure that your soul is just as damned as his. Jesus is saying, don't buy it. Deny it. Deny yourself. Deny what this world has to offer and follow me. And you will live. On a lighter note, it made me think about, like, follow me if you want to live. Come with me if you want to live. That's what we see Jesus saying. But it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us our own ways. They weren't good ways. They were our ways. I wrote this in my notes as I was studying this week. That what you will die for is what you will live for. What you die for is what you will live for. And honestly, I think what our problem is is that these things don't match up. These things don't line up. I think we end up living for things that don't matter and then end up dying for them too. Rather than considering the most important things in life, those things worth dying for, those things worth giving our entire lives for, And then actually living for those things. 
actually considering what are those things that are actually important and then live for those things rather than just like, I'm living and I'm enjoying this. And they eat away and, and, and leave you with nothing in your life. And Jesus is the only thing worth living for. Jesus is the only thing worth dying for. So if we were to flip that around, because Jesus is the only thing worth dying for, he's the only thing worth living for. To give our whole life to him. Everything else in this life can and will be taken from us. But Christ is the one sure thing that, and not even just a thing, but the person who promises never to leave or forsake us. That Jesus is the good portion. And I believe that this is what Paul is getting at in Philippians. And I'm, I'm going to just tell you right now, turn there with me, Philippians 3. We're going to read some Paul. We're going to read some scripture. We're going to read God's word. There's a couple paragraphs that we're going to look at where I believe Paul is trying to drive home this point. He's speaking to everything we've, we've been talking about. Puts it in, in, in the language of saying that everything is garbage in comparison with knowing Christ Jesus and with and, and following Christ Jesus. Everything in comparison is garbage with knowing Jesus. Let's look at it. Philippians 3, we're going to start in verses, or verse 7. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. So they, at one per, point, were considered gains. They were the things that we identified with and held on to. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. And you would think maybe he's bummed out about it. Well, let's keep reading. I consider them garbage. Doesn't sound like he's that upset. That I may gain Christ. I consider them garbage. That I may gain Christ. We can go to the next slide. And be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings, the participations. He wants to be a part of this suffering party that's going on. Becoming like him in his death and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. Everyone who's mature should view things like this. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. I love it. It's just, he's like, if you don't get it yet, God's still working on you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters. And just as, uh, just as you have us as an example or a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. So if you're struggling, if you're looking around, find the people who are living like this and start watching them and following them and, and walking after them. Keep your eyes on those who live as we do. Why? For as I have often told you before, and now tell you again, even, uh, again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. 
And we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. So dear friends, my, my, my plea and my cry to you would be to stop living your life for pleasure. Stop living your life for yourself. Hear Christ's call to put them to death. Put to death the love of your sin, the worries or shame associated with Jesus and his words, and find life in the risen Christ. And if you've started to wander, if you've started to stray, know that there is forgiveness in Christ's finished work on the cross. I don't want to be an enemy of that. His finished work, I don't want to put myself up against that. But come back and put your passions in life to death before it puts you to death. There's an old saying that goes, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. If we are to live for Christ, we must die to ourselves. So church family, please, I'm in the same boat here with you, okay? Deny yourself, pick up your cross, and follow the risen Jesus. And the most, I, I, I was going to end there. I was like, how do we practically do this? What does this practically look like? I can say, die to yourself. Okay. Sure. How can we, how can we practically do this? I think we got to ask a question. Have you submitted your entire life to Jesus? Have you submitted your entire life to Christ? Every decision, every desire, and purpose and plan for your life. Is that his or is that yours? That really quickly is going to start to show you the playing field of what you're dealing with. Whose plan am I dealing with? It's one thing to know that this is what God's called me to. So unless he tells me to do something different, a lot of us don't ask the question. And the problem with a lot of us is we are our own gods. So we're like, yeah, this is exactly what God wants. This is exactly God's plan. We're not God, but have we taken our plans and submitted them to the Lord? Are we following his direction and guidance from his word, from his church body? We have have people in our lives. If we're just making decisions, we should pump the brakes. If we have no counsel and no instruction and, and no people around us, we should pump the brakes. I've needed people in my life to tell me to pump the brakes. I think my way is the best way. I think what I'm doing is exactly right. I don't know everything. None of us know everything. We need people in our lives. We need God's word. We need good counsel. But so many of us just make decisions and do what we want to do because we don't want the input. We don't want the counsel. We don't want the guidance. We want to lead ourselves. Have you submitted everything to Christ? Is it all his? Or are you chasing your own dreams and passions with no consideration or counsel from your Lord? That's the confession. That's the profession. He's my Lord. So would it look like it? Does your life actually look like it's directed by your Lord? And my plea is that you'd hear the call of Christ and abandon any picture of your life if it has not been submitted to or led by Christ. Good news for every one of us is we can stop where we're at, turn around, and start following him. We can redirect. So no one can be like, well, I'm just so (laughs) far gone. Can't change it now. That's not true. If 
if it's not been submitted to or led by Christ, we all have those areas in our life, right? So we don't, it doesn't even have to be a big thing. Sometimes it's a big thing. Probably is a big thing. Also, it could be little things. There's so many areas in our life that we have yet to yield to our Lord that we confess and profess. So deny yourself in the area. Daily take up your cross and follow our risen Lord Jesus. Because it needs to be said that confessing Christ as Lord will cost you everything. Following Christ as Lord will cost you everything. But just like the man who found the treasure hidden in the field had no problem once he saw the worth of that treasure. He had no problem taking everything he had and selling it, getting rid of it, so that he could possess that field, so he could go and purchase and buy what that field had to offer. And so by God's grace and his mercy, I pray that you see Christ as that treasure, that you see the treasure that is Christ as to lose it all, to gain Christ, and in that way, gain everything. Would you please stand to your feet?